the Democrats have lost for 15 years badly at the federal level, and we are well beyond the stage where we could just simply televise our way to victory. It's got to be up to us. We've got to take this into our own hands. And what we're going to talk about today is how to reach out to voters and how to do what is a very difficult job, the job of voter contact. Um, the phone banking, the walking, the how to have your message in 27 seconds, uh, all of those things, and the fundraising as well, all of those things about reaching out to others and to tell them about our candidates, about our ballot issues, that's what this whole thing today is going to be about, and you know whether it's, it's about reaching out and delivering yourself and your message to somebody who doesn't necessarily know who we are and may have been listening to too much of Sean Hannity, but if we do this, if we do this, we're going to win, and it's not a matter of if, it's simply a matter of when. We're also going to talk about the three resources you have to bring that change about. There are three resources that any campaign and any organization have, the only three you get. They're people, money, and time. And you can build and build and build, and you can recruit, and you can ask, and you can get more people. And you can build and build and build, and you can uh, solicit, and you can ask, and you can get more money. But you will never never have an opportunity to get more time. No one gets to fundraise an extra day of the week. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask you guys, how many days do we have left till the election? There's two elections this year. All right, so that's, a, that's an answer that you guys need to have by the end of the day. And the math that we're going to go through, and did I tell you we're going to do some math here? Yeah. Yeah. The math we're going to go through here is uh, math that you can take to your, your own campaign. And whether you're working on a congressional district, you do it for the whole congressional district, or you're working just in a precinct within a congressional district, you could break it down and do the same math and take it home to your own campaign. We've just crossed the line between cold, hard science and political science. Okay. We've made an estimation here that the number of people, the percentage of voters from 2002 is going to be the same in 2006. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, if your county has had tremendous um, influx of uh, new people or exodus of new people, something's happened to the economy, you may want to. Uh, change your calculation a little bit by a few percentage points one way or another. But this is a very good rule of thumb. This morning we're going to talk about message. Uh, I'm sure you all have a good sense of you know, what message means in the, the broader uh, context of the world. And certainly uh, a lot of you are familiar with uh, George Lakoff uh, and folks like that who talk about framing and how to you know, use language to really communicate what you're trying to do. We really can't use our standard language with each other as a basis for communicating with outside people because, frankly, they don't see the world like we do. So our job is to try to put things in a way that people do get it and that we speak a language that other people that we're talking to are actually receptive to. So that's part of the challenge, that we can talk in shorthand to each other about what we'd like to see, about actions we'd like to be involved in, or what we want other people to do. But until we get them involved in the process, until we get them motivated to, to be a part of that process, we're really not doing our job. There are a lot of reasons why people spend their time with you on a campaign, or with you in your organization, or in your precinct. The very first step of understanding how to build your activist base is to understand those motivations for every person who walks in through that door. And to understand that all of those motivations are important. We don't rank them, well, oh, they just support anyone who's a Democrat, or oh, they just support whatever. It doesn't matter, because those people who come through the door, those people who say yes to you when you ask them to volunteer, and we'll go over all of this, those are the people who are your donors. I don't mean money. I mean, they're giving you something that is potentially more valuable to them. They give you their time. So every volunteer who walks in that door, every activist who is pounding the pavement in your precinct, all of these people, you treat them like donors. You wouldn't throw away a $100 check. Why would you throw away a three-hour volunteer? 
What I'm doing at work, site's called uh, actforchange.com, I encourage you to go visit it, is to have people write to their congressman uh, or senator on a particular issue. So if we can get 50,000 messages flooding in saying support Russ Feingold's censure resolution, hopefully that influences the debate just a little bit. Your goal here, obviously you have these various circles, right? This is, uh, we'll vote for Dean, but insert candidate, you know, insert your candidate here. You have these big people, but you also have the core group in here, people who are gonna give money and give time. What you wanna do is have those people go out and become influencers in their communities to get out and build little new circles starting everywhere. You know, uh, the first house party I did for Dean, the next time around, two of the people there that were at my party threw house parties. So you try to multiply. You can do that in two ways. You can either send your people out and each one of us can go and work with our friends, our non-political friends who aren't here with us uh, at this wonderful training this weekend. Go talk to them. But you can also find these people in the communities, right? Find them, bring them the other way, bring them in. Include someone from, let's say, the Bong community onto your steering committee and let them have a voice in your campaign so that when you bring them in here and they feel they're a part of it, this circle that they are at the top of will start to grow exponentially and that gets more people uh, involved, in, involved in your campaign. A good friend of mine always talks about, you know, um, on June 6th, on your election day, you got one day to cast your vote. With vote by mail, you got 30 days. And it's sort of like, well, you know, when I was courting my wife, do I got one shot or do I want 30 shots of getting kisses from her? So, <laughs> no, you want those 30 days because you're going to lose some days. You're not going to get everything you want. So voting by mail has all sorts of opportunities for, for you. And I also want to emphasize that for the minority community, it also plays a huge role in turning out increased minority votes because it is the minority community, the low-income community, that's working at 5.30 in the morning to clean the, the apartments, that's there in the afternoons when you guys leave. And so they are not there on election day. It, it takes a tremendous amount of um, unique opportunities for them to get free in that one day. For the minority community and his Latinos, they have 30 days to do it this way. They also do it in the comfort and safety of their home. Um, and they have family members that can translate for them at, at, the, at their home. So it provides a unique opportunity. 80% of Americans probably agrees with everything that we're doing here in this room right now. But they don't know us because we've been sitting here just throwing it out of the airway and it's always been about how much money do we got so how much money can we spend on television and radio. It's beyond that. Right in the beginning, he quoted some street organizer, some organizer, um, as he was sort of complaining, like, oh, this isn't happening and that isn't happening and why don't they do this and why don't do that and what are they waiting for? And this organizer quotes what I later found to be a, a line from a Hopi poem, um, goes to Jim and says, Jim, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And that's what this training is all about. Um, you're not waiting for you know, the chair of the DNC. You're not waiting for the chair of DFA. You're not waiting for your, you know, whoever else. You're not waiting for pundits on television to get it right. You're not waiting for CNN to get it right or Fox News to <laughs> go away. Um, <laughs> You are the ones we've been waiting for. And that's why we're doing this training session. So, and I promise you that is going to be the answer to about half the questions people will ask. If I don't say, you know, we are the ones we've been waiting for, I will get people who come to me and say, hey, why doesn't DFA do this? And why can't the Democratic Party do that? And blah, 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 framing, messaging, this and that. And because you can do it, and you're the ones who should be doing it. Howard Dean cannot organize your precinct, nor should he be. <laughs> Um, you're the ones you've been waiting for. If you're tired of the Democratic message, um, then why don't you be the person giving the Democratic message? Um, especially because after this training, you'll be able to give a message, you'll be able to count your votes, you'll be able to do things better than, I promise you, most people who are working on campaigns and uh, positions in the Democratic Party. Um, because all we need to do is figure out how to do it right. And that's what we're gonna be doing for the next 18 hours um, this weekend figuring out what to do and how to do it right.